So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Karen Davis, and I'd like to welcome you all to this press briefing with Philip Alston, who is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Professor Alston, who is on an official visit to the United Kingdom at the invitation of the British government, will present his preliminary observations and recommendations following his human rights fact-finding visit over the last two weeks, including the impact of austerity measures, universal credit, child poverty and Brexit. After, the, after his presentation, there will be an opportunity for journalists present to ask questions. So, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, so, I, I do want to start, uh, first of all, by thanking the British government and by thanking all the officials who have made my visit uh, smooth and easy. Uh, I've had um, terrific access from ministers uh, down through local authorities uh, to uh, civil society and other groups. The main thrust of my report is to contrast the great prosperity in Britain, fifth largest economy, one of the leading financial capitals in the world, uh, a thriving industrial and financial centre, um, contrasted with the fact that a fifth of the population, 14 million people, are living in poverty. Four million of those are more than 50% below the poverty line, and one and a half million are destitute. The child poverty rates are staggering and are predicted by the Institute for Fiscal Studies and others to go up significantly over the next couple of years. The picture, however, is much more complex than just rattling off statistics. What has surprised me is the extent to which there is close to unanimity in terms of the <coughs> observations by think tanks, by a lot of media commentators by independent authorities like the National Audit Office, by a whole range of parliamentary committees and others, that poverty is really a major challenge in the United Kingdom and that not nearly enough is currently being done to address the challenges. On the other side, what I found in my discussions with ministers is basically a state of denial. The ministers with whom I met told me that things are going well, that they don't see any big problems, and they are happy with the way in which their policies are playing out. But it's, of course, not the story that I heard in my travels through Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and in quite a few cities in England. What I saw, food banks, schools, community centres, job centres, libraries and elsewhere, is a lot of misery. A lot of people who feel that the system is failing them, a lot of people who feel that the system is really there just to punish them, people who feel that despite the fact that they are really down and need a little bit of help that they could always have counted on in yesterday's Britain, they're just not able to get. And so what I've tried to do in my report is to ask why? What's the motivation for the main policies that seem to be problematic in the benefits area? And the answer that most people come up with is, oh, it's austerity. In other words, the implication is that there was no choice. There was a financial crisis. There was a need to make immense budget savings. And benefits was 
one of the key areas where that could be done. The truth is that, first of all, there haven't been a great many savings from what I can see. A lot of it has involved the transfer over from one set of items to another. A lot of it has been pushed off to the community, to families, to emergency rooms, uh, and to even governmental emergency services rather than in the benefit system itself. I don't see that the motivation has been to create a more compassionate, a more caring benefit system and one that actually produces better life outcomes for people. Instead, the motivation is very clearly, I believe, an ideological one. I don't say that in a necessarily critical way because governments have different ideologies. Governments think of social welfare in different ways. And this government and its predecessor have both been remarkably successful in bringing about a revolution in British welfare policy. They have transformed the nature of the system and particularly the underpinnings of it. The problem that I see is not in terms of the worthy objectives. It is true that employment is a key to getting people out of poverty. It is true that the previous system was confused and confusing. It's true that there are efficiencies that have been found. But what's also happened is that the system epitomized by universal credit, about which I'll talk more in a moment, but not at all limited to that, is in fact driven by the desire to get across a simple set of messages. The state does not have your back any longer. You are on your own. As Margaret Thatcher famously said, there's no such thing as society. The government's place is not to be assisting people who think they can't make it on their own. The government's place is an absolute last emergency order. And so what goes along with that is a sense that we should make the system as unwelcoming as possible, that people who need benefits should be reminded constantly that they are lucky to get anything, that nothing will be made easy. And linked to that is what I would think of as a, a sergeant major mentality. As one MP put it to me, the command and control approach reflected in universal credit. That sanctions should be harsh, should be immediate, should be painful. And yet, all of the evidence that I've seen, notwithstanding various assertions made by DWP, indicate that sanctions are usually counterproductive, that they create fear and loathing among claimants, that they impose immense hardships on people who might have been five minutes late for an appointment, might have screwed up in some other way, but instead of trying to work through with people who are already under immense stress, there is this sudden ton of bricks approach. And the ton of bricks goes from three months to six months and can go into the years. And I think that sort of punitive approach to benefits is utterly inconsistent with the essential underpinnings, not just of what I would see as human rights, but of the whole British sense of community uh, and the values of justice and fairness. My report also focuses on Brexit, which is an issue that seems to be of current interest. I make the argument, which is not going to be all that unfamiliar, that almost no matter what outcome 
Brexit achieves, other than the utopian one which is most unlikely to happen, is going to leave Britain worse off economically. There's going to be a fall in GDP. There's going to be a fall in tax revenues. I don't think that's controversial. I think most Treasury modelling says that. The IMF says it in a very major way. The problem is that there's been almost no discussion about what impact that's going to have on low-income groups. They will, on the, if present policies are maintained, bear the brunt of the economic fallout from Brexit. And to the extent that most commentators think that the Brexit vote itself had an element of economic alienation, of insecurity underpinning it, in fact, Brexit is going to make that worse because those in the lower income levels are really going to suffer. I think it's imperative that that issue be brought much higher up on the agenda. It's every bit as important as getting a lot of things right in terms of the interests of the city, in terms of the free flow of trade and so on. The impact on the British people is not being examined in the way that it should be. I go into some detail on universal credit and I won't try to encapsulate all of the issues here, but I think there are a number of characteristics of it which are particularly problematic and harsh and more interestingly unnecessary and almost gratuitous and could therefore be changed fairly quickly. The five-week waiting period reduced to three for some, but very often amounting to 12 for others because a, an ident identification document can't be found or whatever. That is a, an amazing part of the system, which means that people who are completely unable to cope go to a benefits office, go through the process of applying, succeed and they're told good you've got nothing you're really in desperate straits go away and maybe in five weeks if you're lucky although it might be 12 we'll give you some money they're plunged into misery and despair they're plunged into a circle of having to beg from family and community and then DWP will say no 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 but we could give you an advance so they'll provide an advance if you're really desperate. That advance then needs to be paid off at the rate of 30% from each of your paychecks when they finally start arriving. So you are guaranteed that with a very small benefit amount, 30% of that is immediately taken off. And so it's really getting off to a great start and giving people a wonderful sense of the whole universal credit and DWP process. That should be changed immediately. The payment to a single household has drawn a lot of attention. It's said, and I completely accept it, that the impact on many women is extremely problematic. That they are not able to control the family income that the male in the household dominates and that it even puts them at greater risk of domestic violence. The response that I got from the former Secretary of Work and Pensions was, first of all, 93% of people in the United Kingdom have joint bank accounts anyway, so what's the problem? Well, it would be interesting to see what the figures are for women living in poverty, whether they have joint bank accounts. Most of them don't have a joint bank account because they're solo, even if they're living with someone. She also then went on to say, well, you know, if they're having problems, they should get counselling, and if things are really bad, they should leave. This shows a, a really deep and sensitive understanding of the situation in which such women find themselves. And it's not an option. It's not the way to approach these things, and the government should change that. 
There are a number of other elements that I won't go into in great detail. The digital by default system, I believe, is not working anywhere near as smoothly as the government says. The figures in terms of the number of people who begin a claims process and then abandon it are remarkably high. Close to a third of people give up. Now, I suspect that DWP is quite happy about that in a way. Good, less benefits to be paid. But again, a huge level of frustration and not reflected in the statistics. I think they've overstated the number of people who are comfortable doing all this digitally. And I think the system is, despite their suggestions that there are all sorts of other alternatives, I think it is overwhelmingly pressing people to do everything online. Um, the sanctions I've already talked about, uh, the consequences for those who are sanctioned are grim. I've got a long section in my report about digital um, and automation policies in the welfare area. The United Kingdom sees itself as being at the forefront uh, in world terms uh, in this area, and in some ways it is. But I've also got a number of warnings in here saying that this automation can very quickly cross over into a line where all sorts of compassion, all sorts of human interaction and so on are lost and that a welfare system cannot survive on algorithms alone. The rest of my report, which I'll deal with very quickly because I want to take questions, uh, focuses in particular on what I call the dismantling of the broader social safety net. So it's not just universal credit. It's a big mistake to focus only on that, although, of course, there is immense dislike for the system out there. Um, I, the benefit reductions uh, are pretty draconian. There is an extraordinary disconnect between the triple block that protects pensioners and the freeze that freezes all in-work uh, beneficiaries. Uh, the argument that pensioners couldn't possibly have to put up with that, quite right. Whereas people in work, well, let them uh, suffer, let them lose every year, let them get less. Uh, I think that's deeply problematic. One of the things that I probably feel most strongly about, and I, I think I'll finish on this note, is actually the cuts in local authority budgets. Uh, Britain has famously had a culture of local concern, of people being able to get some sort of assistance from their local council, some sort of human contact. When things go really wrong, there'll be a social worker, there'll be some service they can go to. 49.9% .9 cuts, according to the National Audit Office. And so I meet the leader of the council in Newcastle, and he tells me, we've been reduced to emergency service provision. We're not doing all of the range of things that we think are really essential for our community and that we want to do. We don't have the money. When I meet uh, the um, economic assistant to the uh, Treasury, no, nope, it's fine. Uh, these councils have got a lot of money. Uh, they, can, uh, they can take these cuts. They're doing well. It's a totally uh, mechanical economic analysis that ignores the damage that I think is being done to the fabric of British society, to the sense of community, which has been built in part around the sports centres, the recreation places, the public lands that are being sold off, the libraries that are being closed down, the youth centres that are being downsized. And soon there will be nowhere for people in the lower income groups to go. It's perfect because those um, higher income groups will have more money because their taxes are being cut. But they will find themselves living in an increasingly hostile and unwelcoming society because the community roots are being systematically broken. So I think there are big reasons for concern. I'll end by saying that I think if a new minister was interested, 
if a new government was interested, the harshness, the worst aspects of a lot of these policies could be changed overnight and for very little money. I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to take questions. So we will be taking questions and there will be a roving mic. We, we have a roving mic. <coughs> so if you could just wait until the mic comes <coughs> to you and announce which your name and which organisation you're working for. Um, cause, um, and then, because the, uh, we're streaming this conference and the, we won't be able to hear you until you've got the mic. So shall we start over there? Um, the lady over there, Yoko, thank you very much. Uh, Jackie Long from Channel 4 News. You talk about ministers being in a state of denial. Do you think they don't see the poverty and the problems that you describe, or do you think they choose to ignore them? I think they have a, a, an overriding set of objectives, which are to cut the welfare system, cut what they see as uh, dependency, uh, cut expenditures, and they're looking at that sort of bottom line. Uh, I cannot believe that they are as happy with the system as they assured me they were. I must have met with 40 members of parliament from all parties. And they said, almost as one, they said, we spend all of our damn time in the constituency office dealing with these welfare issues. It's so frustrating, it's so unnecessary, and they won't listen to us. I think. Ministers must be getting that message, but they're not heeding it. Thank you, Professor Olson. Uh, Dragan Astic from UNICEF UK. For the United Nations Children's Fund, uh, child poverty, of course, is a major human rights issue. In 2016, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child expressed its serious concern with the level of child poverty in the UK, the impact of austerity, and lack of any action plan plus removal of targets uh, and child poverty measures. I wanted to ask you whether during your fact-finding mission you had a chance to meet with children, hear from them about their experiences of living in coping with poverty. And also, have you maybe heard some differences in the approach in, 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 in uh, in, in, th throughout the UK, I'm specifically referring to devolved administrations when it comes to child poverty and human rights-based approach. Thank you. Uh, I was very fortunate to meet <coughs> with um, quite a few children in my time here. I met with primary school children, um, often uh, children of uh, immigrants um, or children living in very poor, notoriously poor areas. Uh, I met with um, youth um, in, uh, in a, from inner city London uh, areas uh, and spoke with them at length about their particular concerns about how the closure of a uh, youth community centre affects them, uh, how they live in such uh, terrible housing conditions that they can't stay at home, they've got to get out. But if they get out, they can go to a youth centre and that's great. If they can't go to a youth centre, they're on the streets. On the streets, there are gangs, there are drugs, uh, there are bad things, and that's where one goes. So it makes a huge difference to them if there are services provided or not. Um, in terms of the uh, devolved administrations, I think one of the things that surprised me most is to hear from the officials in Northern Ireland and from the First Minister and the Finance Secretary and others in Scotland, how much time they spent trying to counteract the UK welfare policy. They've got what they call mitigation policies, £125 million a year spent in each of those places trying to make up for the worst, the harshest aspects of the policies being pushed very hard by central government. Uh, that seems to me to be shocking there's got to be a lesson to be learned there. This is not simply a matter of politics. It's a matter of the reaction of people, and it's entirely consistent with what I heard in England. The difference is that in the devolved areas, they're trying to do something about it, but in England, they're not. <coughs> Do you have any more questions? Yeah. 
Sophie Airy from the British Medical Journal. Um, I wanted to just ask what you've observed and whether you've drawn any conclusions about the impact of the policies you've been talking about on people's health. I uh, deliberately didn't try to um, get a deep understanding of the NHS and related developments. I think the area that I picked up on most is probably the area of mental health. Uh, and again, I was surprised at all of the talk of suicide, uh, both the people I met who told me that they had contemplated suicide, uh, the charities who told me that there was a huge upswing in the number of people getting counselling and so on, the fact that the government felt it necessary to appoint a minister for suicide prevention. Uh, alongside that is the focus on loneliness. S sort of seems like an odd issue for government to have to look at, but of course as I discovered more about the local authority cuts and other developments, uh, I can see uh, that's what loneliness is about. Old people people who don't have relatives around the place are increasingly lonely as community facilities uh, disappear and particularly <coughs> as the benefits that are available to them shrink increasingly and they can't even afford a bus fare or whatever else it takes to get out and meet people. Um, uh, combined with that I guess I've already mentioned the extent to which people uh, feel uh, intimidated by, fearful of uh, the, well, the universal credit and related uh, interactions that they have. So I think that uh, there are pretty serious mental health dimensions to the uh, poverty challenges that I've seen here. Hi, uh, Steve Walker from the Squawk Box. Um, you mentioned that you thought that some, most of these problems could be solved overnight with very little cost. I mean, what kind of measures are you thinking of? And, and if it's that simple, are there kind of human rights breach aspects to the uh, fact that the government isn't doing them? I think the, um, I think the five to 12 week um, gap uh, could be resolved overnight. I think that is a one-off uh, issue. I mean, they're trying to push back payments and so on, but simply bringing them forward is not going on a one-time basis is not going to cost uh, a lot of money. I think the single payment to a household, they say that there are significant uh, computerization costs. I'd like to see those costings. I don't accept that a system which has had vast amounts of money poured into it would not be capable of being adjusted to, uh, to do that. Uh, I think the two-child um, policy um, has, I, I'm just not sure how to put this because uh, I don't want it to go in the wrong direction, but China's one-child policy, yes, it was, uh, it was forced, it was physical, but this is in the same ballpark that poor people mustn't have more than two children and if they do the rest of the children are going to suffer it's great it's a really perfect way to punish families for families that had four children a few years ago suddenly have gone into a hole and two, only two children are going to be covered um, so I think there are at uh, the sanctions policy I think the sanctions policy it's been put to me that it's cruel and inhuman it's very hard to disagree with that sort of assessment. And so, yes, I think we could analyse a lot of these policies in terms of their inconsistency with Britain's basic human rights obligations. Hi, I'm Maeve McLennigan from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. 
Um, we've been doing a project logging homeless deaths across the country because there was no centralized system doing that. I wonder if there's other areas where you've seen gaps in data or evidence and whether that's a, a kind of intentional failing from the government in not wanting to know the true scale of some of these issues. I have to admit to being a little surprised um, at the extent to which the British government is uh, reticent, if I can use that word, uh, about collecting detailed uh, statistics about the social condition of the country. Uh, so it's not just uh, uh, homelessness and uh, related issues, but on food insecurity, for example, there is no official data. Uh, we see the huge growth of uh, food banks. Um, we see the results on the streets, um, and yet there's no government survey of the impact of its policies uh, on food security. Who's going hungry in the country? How many? Why? Uh, even issues like poverty, child poverty are left in a sort of limbo because the government has maintained this <coughs> system where there are four different measures that can be brought up uh, at any particular time in order to suit the purposes of the, the speaker. Uh, you can have uh, absolute poverty, which the government insists is really all you should be looking at. You can have relative poverty, which gives a very different result. You can have before housing costs. You can have after housing costs. And it's confusion. Uh, government is not able to be held to account in a meaningful way, doesn't hold itself to account, doesn't have a clear set of policy targets for eliminating poverty. I've said in my report that I think the Social Metrics Commission has done an extraordinary job. Uh, I don't think they were supposed to succeed. I think they were supposed to come up with something that would be uh, divisive and rejected, but the experience has been the opposite. Most people I've spoken to have said, this is a big improvement, uh, it is fair, uh, it's a good measure, and it should be adopted. And I think it would be a huge step forward if the government embraced the recommendations of that uh, commission. Hi, I'm Manoush from the New Statesman. Um, you talked about Britain losing its sense of community. What kind of society are we heading towards if nothing changes, do you think? Uh, I think Britain is heading towards a, a, an alienated uh, society where you have um, pretty uh, dramatic differences between the, to use old language, the upper classes and the lower classes um, defined these days in economic terms rather than uh, royalty or uh, hereditary titles and so on. Um, but I think the era of connect connectivity technologically, the era of social media and so on, make it much less sustainable to have these two dramatically different societies uh, of people living the high life, indeed a higher life than has ever been lived before in terms of limit levels of luxury and so on, but people on the other hand not able to afford a, a tin of baked beans, not able to feed their children on the seventh night of the week, not able to afford shoes for their kids to go to school, um, not able to afford a bus fare to get out of the village to the job centre. I think that is going to create an alienated society and one which won't look like what Britain thinks it wants to look like, and I believe it should look like. Run, Junker. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about kicking people here and there, but it's just a question for you um, uh, first. Uh, Robert Wright from the Financial Times. Um, 
you're obviously the UN rapporteur in um, extreme poverty. Um, what would you say to a poor person in Chad or somewhere like that, a, a real low-income country, um, about what you're doing looking at the situation in the UK, which is undoubtedly very serious, but uh, I think most people would accept is less extreme than in some of the real low-income countries. You know, there's, uh, there's always someone worse off, and I don't think it's a very useful comparator to say, my good man, you're about to get 20 lashes, but I can assure you that in other countries they'll give you 50. Uh, I think poverty is, uh, by almost universal agreement, a relative matter. It's relative to the society in which you live. I think, yes, you can go to Chad, you can go to Mauritania, where I went a couple of years ago, you can go to Ghana, where I went earlier this year, and you can say to them, my friend, how would you like £37.80 uh, a week? And they'd say, my God, I could only dream of that. And I'd say, well, that's what an asylum seeker gets in London. And that's what they've got in order to survive for a full week with their family to cover everything other than housing costs. And I don't think that the person in Mauritania is going to say, wow, that sounds great. I'd really like to go and live in the UK on that sort of money. They would say, I've at least got family. I've at least got my tribe, my community. Um, I can survive here on much less, but my life is not that bad. So I think those sort of comparisons are actually really quite unhelpful and not very instructive. Uh, I think every country has to be measured against what it's capable of doing. And Britain is certainly capable of eliminating most, if not all, of its poverty if it wanted to. But it's clear there's a political choice that it doesn't want to. It would prefer to offer tax cuts to the wealthy than to uh, remove hundreds of thousands, maybe a million or more, out of serious poverty. Hi, thank you. Uh, Manuel for RTTV. Um, my question is very simple. Um, I understand every single thing you've said, but I'm just wondering, should the UK government then spend more money on welfare and benefits, or should it do the exact opposite and create um, a system to discourage welfare dependency? Because that seems to be part of the issue and ultimately it makes it seem like nothing is really working. Um. I think you'd be hard-pressed to come up with too many ideas that would uh, really um, provide greater discouragement than already exists. Uh, I think the notion that people are willingly sitting around at home because life is so good on benefits uh, disappeared a long time ago. Uh, so I don't think that you can come up with much more... Um, of a, a punitive or deterrent nature. I don't deny that employment rates are great. I think it's wonderful that so many people are in employment. Um, that, however, doesn't remove the problem of poverty because one of the issues that I haven't talked about but that is in my report is, of course, the extent of so-called in-work poverty. And that was an issue that uh, has been brought to my attention over and over again that people are shocked that someone who's working full-time or someone who's doing five jobs that add up to 25 hours a week uh, still is going to food banks, uh, still is not making enough to be able to support themselves and their family. Uh, so, you know, I, good luck. Uh, I don't think there's any, any Western, any developed society that doesn't realise that governments have to uh, provide certain basic forms of assistance to counteract the inevitable consequences of having a capitalist system. A capitalist system has winners and losers. That's what it's all about. Uh, that's its strength. But its weakness is that the losers cannot cope on their own because they're left so far behind 
and the introduction of a welfare state or the introduction of a social security net is designed precisely to enable the system to keep working, uh, to keep being competitive, to keep creating winners, but to make sure that there are not then a lot of losers who just fall off the wagon. My name's Simon Collier. I founded the Association Pension and Benefits Claimants. Is this working? Is this it, it is a mic for the, stri for the streaming of the press conference, so it's oh. not actually a mic. In oh, okay. I, uh, I'm fine. Okay. We've got about 3,000 articles on our website, and um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of talk about universal credit, but people don't fully understand all the bad things about it. For example, when people apply, um, they used to just get their rent used to get all their rent paid and then their benefits. What's happening now is they're paying, <coughs> putting all in one payment and they're taking away some of the rent and so you're having to pay that with your actual uh, benefits. And now, whereas <coughs> they just used to sanction your job seeker's allowance, they're now possibly sanctioning the whole of your rent, your rent as well. And these sort of things are not, not coming up. My question is that um, about 120,000 people have actually died um, and but what the government hasn't done is release the statistics for those who've died who were declared fit to work. Do you see? Have you made any headway on that, um, on getting that information at all? Uh, I'm uh, well aware of all the arrangements in terms of rent and the consequences and so on. Uh, I have not got those statistics, and I didn't actually ask for them from government. But it certainly is a, an important element. I think that's one of the illustrations of why we need to get a better sense of what the impact of these policies has been. Uh, I think the National Audit Office, which is a, a national treasure from what I can see in terms of the seriousness of their reporting and analysis, uh, has produced a series of reports that uh, identify quite a few problems with the way in which universal credit is functioning and the uh, challenging very strongly some of the claims that the government has made about the achievements that have come out of universal credit. Hi, it's hello, May Bullman from The Independent. Um, I just wanted to ask, did you find that um, the UK's immigration policies contributed to some of the poverty that you saw in the country? Uh, you might have to speak. No, I, 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 no I got it. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Sorry. The, quest question was, did I, the question was, did I find that UK immigration policies have contributed significantly to poverty? Um, I don't want to get into the broad area of immigration policy um, because it's beyond my remit. Uh, but what I did look at is the a situation particularly of asylum seekers, uh, and I think they are kept in a, of course, I have to admit that it's not easy for an Australian to talk about inhumane asylum policies because we have the world record, uh, but it's true that expecting asylum seekers to survive without access to any government services and on the £37 a week uh, is entirely unrealistic and uh, very uh, punitive uh, and enabling those people to seek work in a full employment economy would be again a minor concession that should certainly be contemplated in my view. Uh, Rob Booth from The Guardian. Um, Philip Alston, has the uh, British government breached its obligations under uh, um, uh, the, you know, the covenant that it has signed on economic and social rights? Is it in breach of those human rights obligations that it's signed up to? I, I've tried to avoid uh, framing my report in a sort of legalistic way. Uh, I think that what's really central is for the government and the British people to 
understand the impact of these policies in terms of British values uh, and in terms of stated government policies and so on. But if pressed uh, from a professional point of view as a, a proponent of human rights and as a representative of the UN human rights system, I think there is no alternative but to conclude that the obligations in a range of conventions, whether it's the Convention on the Rights of the Child, whether it's the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination, of all f uh, discrimination Against Women, uh, and the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, there are quite a number of provisions uh, which I think um, are not at all satisfied by existing British policies. Matteo Natalucci for International Insider. So my question is, uh, um, new techno technologies like AI are going to ch change the market, the, um, the ways that we consider the economy and also will have huge impact of unemployment. Do you think the government is doing enough uh, in reshaping uh, and uh, creating uh, a digital skill around the marketplace or do you, need, do you think they will need some help from the private sector as well in delivering this? Thanks. Uh, well, um, first I think this government is acutely conscious of the importance of technology. Uh, it has, as I set out in my report, um, uh, prided itself uh, on being a pioneer in the use of artificial intelligence on big data and so on. I don't think there's any uh, real uh, risk of the government being unaware of the importance of those developments. Um, I think uh, my report goes out of its way to say that for all of us, these technologies are relatively new. We uh, often proceed without much understanding of how they operate. We have a big problem that a lot of the algorithms that are used are uh, not transparent for a whole range of reasons. And as the systems become more and more automated, uh, the greater is, are the risks uh, that the systems will function in ways that they should not. Uh, I call in the report for a greater uh, linking of human rights concepts to uh, information technology developments. Um, I'm frustrated, I have to say, but this is general and not just the UK, that in the IT area the talk is immediately of ethics and I'm not opposed to ethics, you'll be pleased to hear, but there's no definition of ethics. Ethics is sort of what you want it to be. So it's a very convenient floating uh, reference frame, and I think we need to start defining ethics, if that's the key term, uh, in relation to the human rights obligations that exist. <coughs> Thanks. Um, Eve Nelson from Quartz. I wanted to go back to your point about the Minister for Suicide Prevention and the Minister for Loneliness and the government's strategy in general um, around loneliness and just get more of your thoughts on that strategy and how you know, they've decided to involve uh, private companies, supermarkets, whatever, into it, given that it seems that many of the causes um, stem from the government's own social cuts. And also ask if you have um, kind of takeaways for other countries that they can learn from Britain's dive into austerity over the last decade? Well, I think <coughs> um, mental health, uh, loneliness, suicide, and related issues can't be isolated. You can't take someone who's on the street with no food or no shelter and say, Come on, my good man, get up. Don't be lonely. Let's have a talk. Uh, the loneliness comes from the economic and social isolation from the system that has put you where you are. And so while it's certainly good to acknowledge that there are these broader problems, the solutions must lie in the broader system. 
Um, I have no difficulty with uh, relying on the private sector to contribute, but I don't think the private sector will ever be the lead agent in compassion, in reaching out, in providing the essential services that people suffering from these other challenges really need. And so it won't be outsourced effectively to the private sector, and it won't be resolved by simply having a person who says, yep, that's my job, um, I'm looking at that. Uh, it needs to be a, a broader set of policies across government. I'm not, I, I, I probably won't answer that um, because it's all so dependent on the situation. Every country has a very different context, very different set of welfare policies, very different responses to these, and it's not going to be helpful for me. Sorry. Charlotte Rose, BBC in Essex. Philip, when you came to Jaywick on Sunday, you heard from several people who had been in full-time work but found themselves unable to work now because of disability. Um, have you had any thoughts? You've talked a lot about universal credit, but have you had any thoughts about disability benefits and in particular the assessments required to retain those benefits and in some cases the downgrading for individuals uh, when they are on disability benefits? I think there's no doubt that uh, people with disabilities have been hit particularly hard by the changes in the benefit system. Uh, and I met with people not just in uh, Jaywick but uh, across the country uh, who uh, suffer from disabilities and who were feeling uh, a very uh, big crunch. Um, many of them were still getting benefits, but those benefits had been reduced uh, dramatically. Uh, many others were put in a position where the assessment had concluded that they were not really uh, disabled and they should simply get out and work. Uh, I heard many stories um, along the Daniel Blake uh, line that, well, I was asked just if could I snap my fingers, and I could, and I was asked if I could put my hand on my back, and I could, and at that stage I was told, great, fit for work. Uh, and I said, but, 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 but what about my and then, you know, describing the various disabilities and so on. No, nope, you can work. And I think that was a huge cause of frustration and disbelief. Um, all of these struggles to say, but excuse me, the, the unmedically qualified private sector person who did this assessment is going directly counter to all of the medical advice that I've got here. And people then saying, well, sorry, hard to believe that or you need to get the records for us, then discovering that GPs and others uh, either don't want to provide the records at all or want 20 or 30 quid in order to do it, and I wouldn't be seeking benefits so I could pay 30 quid to my doctor just to say, yes, he's got a disability. So I think there are endless problems that people with disabilities uh, uh, have encountered as a result of the changes, uh, and I think it's an area where uh, the lack of compassion, the lack of trying to really understand the uh, challenges confronted in life by many of those people um, is, uh, is a real problem. Uh, we have one more question over there. I think that's <coughs> probably um, the last question. Okay. Okay. Data in the Sky News. The, the situation you're describing seems to be one in which the government views the the circumstances and, and the needs of very significant numbers of people as unimportant. What, what do you think can, can be done in order to you know, make the government accountable to, to these groups that, that are suffering in this way? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go quite so far as to say that the government thinks the lives of those people are unimportant, but rather that they have convinced themselves 
that employment is all that matters. And if the employment statistics are as good as they are now, then Britain is working and there shouldn't be poverty. And I think they need to focus much more. They need to do a serious accounting on the extent of in-work poverty. So whenever uh, the gig economy was raised, for example, Deliveroo and Uber and various other uh, forms of employment where there are no benefits, no security, no assurance of particular hours or scheduling uh, for the most part. Uh, government ministers were completely dismissive. No. 3% of the um, total workforce only. It's, it's not, a, not a, an issue. Well, excuse me, minister, but 3% is a mere million people. Uh, of those million people, if you take out maybe students, most of them are going to be poor people because I wouldn't be doing gig economy work and most of your friends wouldn't be either. Um, and so I think what we need to do is to get a better understanding, not just of the gig economy, but of the many other contexts. Uh, single women uh, caring for children, the worst hit of all. Um, they are in an incredibly difficult position trying to balance out all of the demands while surviving on absolutely minimum uh, wages. Um, the uh, concern for that particular group, and in fact, le let me take this opportunity to say, I think that there is a really remarkable gender dimension of many of the reforms. I think if you had got a group of misogynists in a room and said, guys, how can we make this system work for men and not for women? They wouldn't have come up with too many other ideas than what's already in place. So women, lone parents, make up only 90%. In other words, only 90% of lone parents are women. So which group do you think does absolutely worst in the whole benefits system? Lone parents. But when I said to ministers and others, do you think there's a gender dimension here? They'd sort of look at one another and say, no, 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 I think the policies are fair. But the sort of analyses that I saw indicate that you can go through a lot of the different policies and look at quite differential impacts between men and women. And I think that's a, a really major issue that should be addressed uh, in a systematic way. What are the differential impacts? So, thank you very much for coming. <coughs> and, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for coming. Yeah.